Welcome everybody, time for another AWRA webinar and uh, as usual we've got another great one today. Going back to groundwater where we were last month with the alleys, we've got Sharon Megdahl, Dr. Sharon Megdahl who's professor and director of the Water Resources Research Center at the University of Arizona speaking on groundwater governance and management in the USA. Uh, Sharon is a, a good friend, she's also a member of the AWRA Board of Directors and if I'm not mistaken also on the board of directors of the Central Arizona project down there in down there in Arizona. Let me give you some tips for participating. Uh, we encourage questions. We'll have a Q&A session after the webinar is over. What will happen is you will um, use the um, essentially a chat room to send your questions to myself and Christine McCrane, and then we will ask Sharon the questions at the end of the um, webinar. So you don't have the ability to speak directly with Sharon. So we'll take care of that for you. That also works pretty well because sometimes the questions need to be um, edited, not for language or anything, but just for um, succinctness and a few other things. So um, the webinar recording and Sharon's PowerPoint uh, will be displayed uh, shortly, probably within a week, the PowerPoint will be displayed as a PDF and if you registered for this webinar you will be able to access the entire recording and uh, Sharon's presentation. The catch is you will need a Dropbox account to access this and Dropbox is free so this is not another charge or anything like that. I also want to thank our sponsors um, MWH which is now a part of Stantec for providing our template or our platform. Uh, we couldn't do this without Lisa Butler and the gang down there in Sacramento. Here's the program, okay, Eastern Daylight Time. I'm doing the introduction and then we have Sharon Megdahl and I um, half jokingly refer to Sharon as the groundwater governance guru. Uh, but it's actually no joke. She's quite well known in this field and is like one of the go-to people in the world if you want to do groundwater governance. So you're going to hear from the best today, but that's usual. Here she is now, got that beautiful smile. Um, if you detect somewhat of an accent, uh, Sharon is from New Jersey, just across the river from New York from me. So years ago we would have been at odds, but now we're good buddies. So it's great to have her on. Um, oh yes, there I am. Uh, we've got a semi-beautiful day here in Corvallis, which means it's not raining. Uh, there's Christine. She's in Middleburg, Virginia, the heart of horse country. She's ready to go. Let me just give you um, a little introduction as to what's coming up next week. Um, Sarah Porterfield from the University of Colorado is going to talk about the Colorado River Basin and the American Nile, and uh, we're looking forward to that as usual in uh, July. Uh, we've got Anna Sarayobe talking about IWRM and the Floods Directive. What can the U.S. learn from the EU? Um, a lot, I hope. And we've got more flood risks. Okay, so we're going to the California Central Valley. That's on in mid-August with a large group of people from uh, CH2M and um, California DWR. Then we talk about groundwater droughts in September from Texas Tech University. And um, we do have some uh, webinars scheduled, well not quite scheduled for October, we're going to be hearing from the folks down at the city of Miami Beach on some of their flood proofing and I think you're going to like that very much. We don't have the exact title yet but um, we'll get it shortly. If you have an idea for a webinar for 2018, Christine and I are scheduling so if you could just um, shoot me the speaker's name, contact information, topic and why you think it's important and we'll take it under advisement. And so that's how we get a lot of these people suggest them. So without any further ado, I think it is time to turn it over to Dr. Megdahl. Sharon, it's all yours. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Michael. And it's a pleasure to be uh, giving this uh, seminar today. And I'm going to try to keep it to about 40 minutes. I always like to tell people um, that how many slides I have so you know what to expect. I have 36 slides and if I'm running out of time I'll start going through things more quickly a little later in the in the presentation. I do want to note that um, throughout the slides you'll see websites listed such as right here on my cover slide the Water Resources Research Center website. Um, 
and, and throughout because we post a lot of our materials, our studies, our results, so feel free to browse some of the pages I provide to you um, after the seminar. Uh, I am director of the Water Resources Research Center and professor of soil, water, and environmental science here at the University of Arizona. It's an absolutely beautiful day here. Uh, I describe beauty in terms of it's not going to be too hot, and I think today's high will be 84, so that's truly a beautiful day. And this is our building here where we're located. It's the old Boy Scouts building in Tucson, and I like to point out the motto for the Boy Scouts is be prepared, which I think is a good thing when you're working on water management issues. The Water Center conducts applied research, does a lot of engagement and education, uh, and connects to the real world of water policy and management and, um, and issues out there. So I'm going to talk today about a number of different efforts that um, I, along with colleagues, have been involved with related to groundwater governance and management. Uh, I've done a lot of work, uh, to use the pun, I've got my feet wet working on groundwater recharge about over 25 years ago when I headed up a regional water district in the Tucson area. Um, I've been involved with the practical side as well as looking at it from the academic side of groundwater governance and management, and I'm going to talk particularly about uh, some projects listed here, a 2013 survey, a three case study, a second survey. I'm also involved in uh, transboundary aquifer assessment. I'll say a little bit about that. And all of this related to the general issue that groundwater is invisible. Um, it's very important to the water supplies of many states in the United States and, and to countries around the world, but we don't often have a good understanding of it. We often don't manage it as well as we could or govern it as well as we could. So a lot of this effort is relating to looking at the potential for improving practices. And again, um, I write a column every quarter. I show here a PD, uh, an image of the PDF of one on invisible water. And again, I'm showing websites so that you can look and find some of the materials. So I am a professor, and I do teach a course in water policy. And I always like to point out in my various lectures, whether it be to the public or students, that water policy reflects many determining factors. And as you can see on this list, I list some of them that are, um, I would say, obvious to us, you know, resource availability, the location of the water demands and supplies. But I have a few of this uh, list, a few items underlined, such as the legal framework, and also the extent to which uh, water is, governance and management is are centralized versus decentralized. And this is a big issue for us in the United States because we, in fact, do have a very decentralized approach to water governance and management. And I also like to point to the importance of the context and a particular uh, aspect of context is the geographic context. And this is very important for me to point out because as Michael pointed out, which I didn't know he would, I did grow up in New Jersey. I went to school there and then moved out here to Arizona quite a number of years ago and wasn't a water person back then. I became a water person um, after moving out here more through um, some experiences and on the applied side than the um, my academic body of uh, learning and experience prior to then. And um, I'm sure you all know where Arizona is, but I wanted to point out that we, we do uh, share a border with the state of Sonora to the south of us. And we do know that groundwater does not respect political boundaries. And so it's very important when we look at groundwater, like surface water as well, we look at the geographic context in which we're um, considering uh, management. And I put out uh, up here the map of the Colorado River Basin because um, Arizona as a state relies on groundwater for about 40% of its supplies, Colorado River water, both along the western boundary of Arizona where it flows as well as in the center of the state. And occasionally I'm going to use my cursor here as a map. We have the Central Arizona Project, which Michael mentioned, which travels 336 miles from 
uh, the western border of the state into Phoenix and then Tucson to deliver surface water, the Colorado River, uh, River supplies another 40% of Arizona supplies, with the remainder being other surface supplies in the state and reclaim water. And so when we think about our water management here, um, we have to think about this big picture and um, the Colorado River Basin supplies water to about 40 million people in the western United States. So wherever you are, you always have to think about the geographic context. And I wanted to note here, growing up uh, as a water professional in Arizona, as I mentioned, groundwater is very important. Arizona adopted the Groundwater Management Act in 1980, one of the uh, most progressive a state approaches to groundwater regulation in the nation. And this is our recently released, just uh, came back from the printers within the last two weeks, uh, Arizona water map poster. And I blew up this um, little segment, this little map here that shows groundwater use by groundwater basin or water use. And the turquoise colors show where more than 75% of the water supply in those groundwater basins or the water used in those groundwater basins comes from groundwater. So out here where I live, groundwater is very important. Uh, I also like to point out the water cycle context to remind everybody no new water is created. It may change location, form, quality, and the like. I particularly like this graphic, which is from a prior version of our map, because it shows aquifers here. I'm showing that with the arrow. It blows them up to show that an aquifer in general, there may be some exceptions, is not an underground pristine lake, but water interspersed with gra uh, and gravels and other kinds of coarse materials. So what do we mean when we're talking about groundwater governance? This first bullet is a, provides a definition that is from the paper. I provide a snapshot of the title below where we define groundwater governance as the overarching framework of groundwater use laws, regulations, and customs, as well as the processes of engaging the public sector, the private sector, and society at large. It is more than government. It is the system in which the government operates and all of the regulations, et cetera. A management, from my perspective, is more of the what do we do. And so the regulations may establish the limitations, the options, and then the management is what we do in the context of those. Do we use groundwater? Do we use surface water? Do we recharge? That sort of thing. There's been a lot of effort in the last um, five to six years to uh, define or identify best practices in water governance. There was a large undertaking by the Global Environmental Facility and UNESCO and others looking at groundwater governance in particular. The website for um, the project is provided there. There are some excellent and extensive reports and materials on that site. Um, there is an OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Water Governance Initiative that started around 2013. It's not limited to uh, groundwater. It's looking at water governance generally and trying to identify best practices and gauge how different jurisdictions are, are managing and governing their water. Um, and that's an active effort. And I do have to say, though, there are as many definitions of governance as there are papers and projects. Um, we just tried to come up in the paper that was published in October, September, October 2015 issue of Groundwater, a single sentence definition, because you'll see definitions that um, appear that are multiple sentences, very complex, but they're similar. Now, I do want to mention that the work I'm going to talk about um, in the next set of slides really emanated from this, uh, my experience working as part of the groundwater governance effort, this GEF, UNESCO et al. effort. And what they were doing is they were holding regional consultations in five different locations around the world trying to uh, get information from different jurisdictions 
uh, often at the national level, sometimes subnational, about their groundwater governance practices. And the very last of the five regional consultations was going to be held in, in The Hague in um, March of 2013. The U.S. was part of that regional consultation. And but through my involvement, I just kept seeing maps like this following map. You know, you look at whether there's water scarcity or aridity or what the situation is, and the U.S. would be shown with one single color. But we know, in fact, that we have a mosaic in the U.S. in terms of reliance on different water sources, in terms of weather and climate. And so when we speak to the U.S., we really have to recognize that circumstances differ uh, across the states. And so uh, we decided to undertake a study that is shown here under phase one, a mostly descriptive study, which we call the initial survey, to look at what are the groundwater governance practices across the U.S. The, so we started, we started with this initial survey, but we thought big at the beginning and called it the U.S. Groundwater Governance Survey Project, uh, with the overall objectives to inventory current trends in the U.S. in terms of groundwater governance, define the state of practice, and then provide information in support of policy strategies and the like. And so that was the overall bigger objective, with this phase one being descriptive, this initial survey. We didn't have a lot of time to undertake it. It was self-funded here at the Water Center and University of Arizona. And so the approach we took was to survey a single knowledgeable point of contact in each state in the District of Columbia we included to obtain information. We conducted the survey just over a few month period using an online uh, system and um, then compiled the results. To give you just um, a general sense, and I will note that the report on this initial survey is available on our website in the groundwater uh, tab. I provided that website earlier, but again, if you just go to wrrc.arizona.edu backslash groundwater, you can find it. And that is not surprisingly, um, there is diversity in terms of the users of groundwater subject to state groundwater regulations. I'll have a slide on that in a moment. Obviously, uh, we see a diversity of tools and strategies to manage groundwater use and quantity. Uh, the governance priorities vary by state. Um, the courts get involved in disputes and the like. That varies also uh, across states. And uh, we found significant variation exists in recognizing the connection between surface water and groundwater and also in considering the water needs of groundwater dependent ecosystems. I'm not going to show you the slide that we uh, prepared on this question of do the states recognize or does your state recognize the connection between surface water and groundwater because when I did show that in the past what I found out was sometimes people from the same state had different opinions about whether there was a connection recognized in the in the law and in the ground in the governance practices and so this is an area that requires further research that we just have not been able to undertake yet and then you'll see I'll show you some information about just institutional capacity to carry out responsibilities so here's some of the here's some of the findings um, from that initial survey and uh, you'll see question number um, listed at the top. To which of the following user groups do groundwater regulations apply? And you could see that um, the number of states that regulate different types of users uh, varies quite a bit. I should note that for this survey, we primarily targeted respondents from water quantity agencies at the state level. And um, you'll see in a moment another slide that shows there's separation of those authorities in most states. Uh, this slide shows 
some difference in the tools used to manage groundwater quantity versus quality. Quantity is on the left, quality is on the right, and you see there's more uh, use of permits um, in, in terms of quantity. You'll see when it comes to extraction fees, obviously that's on the quantity side more than quality. Uh, even monitoring is, is higher on the quantity side. Again, though, these were mostly water quantity agency people responding. Um, we'll have some, I'll have a slide later that, that um, shows this, uh, some responses from people from water quality agencies. On this issue of do separate agencies deal with water quantity and quality, you see that in most states there is separation. And it was interesting to me when I showed this slide at an in-state conference here in Arizona, uh, a very good friend from the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality said, oh, that's really interesting. I didn't realize that it was separate in so many states, um, which again underscores some the value of perhaps getting this kind of summary information out is that we all get so very busy in our own states and understanding our own situations that we sometimes don't have the chance to step back and take a look what are other states doing. And th these data were from that um, the 2012 to early 13 survey. So if there has, has been some change in a particular state since then, that wouldn't be reflected in, in this particular slide. And then we asked a question about have there been substantial changes in groundwater management over the last few decades? Um, and you'll see in many, many states answered uh, yes. Uh, again, the last few decades was kind of broad. Um, in retrospect, we probably should have been a little bit more specific on the time frame. But it does show there being some change. And then one of the uh, questions we asked about is whether groundwater information is accessible to the public. And we had a lot of people saying, yes, it's extremely accessible, highly accessible, but some just said somewhat accessible. And again, these were the responses given to us by the experts that we interviewed. And then this is an interesting slide, I think, is that we did ask uh, the respondents if they thought that their agency or at the state level they had sufficient capacity to enforce the groundwater priorities. And this graph shows the responses of yes in gray and no in blue with an overlay. The, the hash marks, the diagonal marks, are for the states that identified declining groundwater levels as a priority. So you can see that there are plenty of instances where there's blue saying they don't have sufficient capacity um, with the hash marks on top of it saying that declining groundwater levels are a priority. And again, these are data from 2012-13 uh, before, let's say, California enacted its Sustainable Groundwater Management Act perhaps their answer now would, would be yes, as opposed to um, no. So that's just an overview. There were, there's a lot more information in our report on that initial survey. But we've been busy since then doing uh, quite a bit of writing and additional research. And we have a chapter out called uh, Go Groundwater Governance in the United States, a Mosaic of Priorities and Approaches. This chapter is under review right now for a book being prepared that's looking at groundwater governance internationally. And we were asked to write a, a chapter on the US. And I, I noted the last names of my colleagues here because I do want to acknowledge that all of this work has been done in collaboration with other researchers, uh, often here at the University of Arizona, and um, none of this would be possible without them, uh, including assistance from graduate students. This particular graphic is one based on the 2012-13 initial survey with um, an update about um, 
well, the the gray shows if you look at it uh, at the caption states that rely on groundwater for more than 30% of their human needs and have identified declining aquifer levels as a concern. And so this goes back to the question, what are your concerns? These states identified declining aquifer levels as a concern and then the reliance of 30% or more of human needs is based on data from the last USGS census, which is based on 2010 data. The report didn't come out until about 2015. And you can see the western United States and, and southern and western are all shaded in. These are not in all cases, but in many cases states that have quite a bit of agricultural activity and reliance on groundwater for for them. It's interesting that Michael Campana's state is one of those shaded and um, he might have something to say about that in, in the discussion. It's not only states in arid regions or states like Oregon that's partly very wet and humid and part not uh, wet and humid. So um, we thought that was an interesting um, graphic. Um, I want to now move to another case study which um, I call uh, the three case study project. And this is another one that's a small one. Um, and by small, I mean limited funding. We had a USGS 104B grant. Um, a graduate student, Yi Huang, uh, did some very nice research. We picked out three sub-state regions, because I want to mention, I mentioned earlier that groundwater governance and management are decentralized. They're decentralized and a lot of authority with the states and then within states you see quite a bit of difference and delegation to sub-state regions. And so in this study we took a look at Orange County Water District in California which is known for its uh, reuse of highly treated wastewater and integration of that into its water portfolio. We took a look at the Prescott AMA here in Arizona. AMA stands for Active Management Area, where they have to comply with 100-year assured water supply rules. And the growing community of Prescott Valley, Prescott Valley and the city of Prescott have been uh, partnering on the planning of a groundwater transportation project from north of that area into the region and had to come up with funding to uh, pay for that pipeline, which is not yet built. And the town of Prescott Valley undertook an auction of effluent credits, and uh, that was a very successful effort and a very innovative effort to raise funds to build the infrastructure it needed to, to keep the water supply secure um, for 100 years into the future. And then the third area we looked at was the Orlando area in Florida where um, they have a very large aquifer beneath them, but there are concerns about the environmental uh, flows uh, that are required to maintain um, the riparian areas and aquatic life. And they undertook an effort to collaborate prior to lawsuits being filed and so forth and acted in a very proactive way. And so from this um, study, and we do have this publication that I show here in environmental management, we drew some lessons and conclusions that regional approaches at different geographic scales are needed, again, because the groundwater does not respect jurisdictional boundaries. Um, surface water and groundwater uh, basins are not necessarily the same, and so sometimes you have to come uh, together as they did in Florida where they have regional water districts dealing a lot with the surface water basins. The Orlando area that is the focus of this effort um, spans three of those regional uh, water districts in Florida. And that innovations will arise out of the need to meet the long-term water needs of a, of a region in the context of the legal framework. Uh, robust stakeholder engagement is important. It is important for all three of those areas. Um, uh, I can't say more than that right now due to time limitations. And that again, um, 
the idea is to share best practices for regional cooperation and we can learn from each other. So I'm going to move now to just a few words about the transboundary efforts that we've been involved in here. We've had uh, an ongoing binational groundwater study through the U.S.-Mexico Transboundary Aquifer Assessment Program. And I'm showing here at the bottom, in the middle panel at the bottom here, I pointed out earlier that Arizona and Sonora share a border. There are two aquifers that we've been studying, the Santa Cruz Aquifer and the San Pedro Aquifer here uh, in Arizona with our Sonoran colleagues and in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey. And then there ha have been two aquifers studied along the Texas-New Mexico border um, and, and Mexico. And this is about assessment. This is not about governance and management yet whether it will be remains to be seen, but here again the institutional legal structure for managing groundwater resources at the state and federal levels become very important to the question of will there be transboundary governance and management of groundwater. We have examples through treaty of transboundary binational management of surface waters, but not at this point at the U.S.-Mexico border on groundwater. And here's a paper that a colleague, Chris Scott, and I authored in 2011 about institutional and legal asymmetries, which make it particularly challenging to think about how we might approach uh, groundwater governance binationally at, at this border. We're very proud that um, We've been working collaboratively with our uh, Mexican counterparts, both university and governmental, and the uh, transboundary study of the San Pedro Aquifer, one of those two I showed you earlier uh, along the border of Arizona, U.S., and Sonora, Mexico, has just been released. It's a first ever binational, bilingual study and we're just waiting to get back from the printer a very nice um, six-page brochure that we developed that's fully bilingual. So again, we have information on this on our website, which is that same wrrc.arizona.e, in this case, backslash TAAP for TAP. And again, the slides will be made available to you, and so all these websites will be there. Um, so one other thing before I get to the last component of, of the talk, which is about a more recent survey, is that this whole question of what to do to raise awareness about groundwater, that unlike surface water, it cannot be seen. Uh, some hydrologists, or hydrogeologists who work on, on groundwater often say that um, it maybe doesn't get groundwater, doesn't get the attention it deserves. So over a year ago, the AWRA and the National Groundwater Association joined forces on the Groundwater Visibility Initiative. We held a workshop a year ago, April, in Denver on this, and then together and this includes Michael Campana and myself and John Tracy and Bill Alley from NGWA and Lisa Butler. We uh, summarized the results of the workshop in a couple of different publications, including Impact of, of AWRA and um, the Groundwater Journal put out by NGWA. And the point I want to make here is that there are a lot of people out there working hard to help people understand that you can't always look at things at the big, let's say, surface water basin. You really have to look at the, the, the groundwater basin, and groundwater is often, um, it can be transported, but otherwise is a very local resource. And in the international uh, context, at a conference a year ago, June, the International Symposium on Managed Aquifer Recharge, there was a bit of a side group convening to develop what they called a call to action. Um, what, what needs to be done for sustainable groundwater management into the future? 
and Bill Alley and I were involved in both of these efforts and there was a tremendous overlap and an effort to then bring this up to the International Association of Hydrogeologists and like. So just trying to say that this the efforts to uh, bring attention to the importance of groundwater and the importance of good management of groundwater continue in many dimensions uh, globally um, and, and also kind of in terms of areas of expertise. So I want to move now to speak to the second survey we undertook here at the Water Resources Research Center. This one we uh, focus more on water quality, groundwater quality experts. It again was proposed as a um, state level survey. Um, I should say, since I mentioned the word proposed, in the middle of all this, we did attempt to get some funding for a broader, more comprehensive look at groundwater governance um, across the US, but unfortunately, we're not successful even though the proposal got good reviews. All of you out there listening who propose various research projects to funding agencies know that happens quite often. A proposal is liked, but it isn't, it's, it isn't funded. But we did get a small grant from the Groundwater Research and Education Foundation, which is a foundation connected to the Groundwater Protection Council. And we, um, embarked on a survey of 67 questions to better understand the current status of groundwater use concerns, laws and regulations, again with a, with a focus on respondents from the water quality side of things, recognizing that earlier uh, separation of authorities across different state agencies as shown in the map. And so I show you here on the slide uh, where the respondents came from, many from state environmental departments, there were some from natural resources, water agencies, uh, departments of health. We were having trouble getting respondents from all of the states, um, from the state agency level. So we did go to our colleagues at other water resources research institutes around the, the country and USGS Water Science Centers in a couple of instances. And I'm sorry to say that we just were not successful in getting response from Florida. So we, we have response from 49 states, but not any response from Florida. And of course, not every respondent responds to every uh, question. And here again, I list the collaborators. Uh, Ethan Vimont, who's a graduate student just finishing up here. Andrea Gerlach and then Jacob Peterson Perlman, a research analyst here, and Ethan and Jacob helped a lot getting these results together um, and helping develop the slides that I'm going to show you because we're actually in the process of finalizing our report to the uh, foundation that provided funding. And once it's submitted and completed, um, we will post that on our groundwater page. I'd also like to note that we got great advice and input along the way from an advisory committee from the Groundwater Research and Education Foundation, particularly Mike Weirman and John Kenney. So just to run through a couple of slides fairly quickly here, um, I have them all marked draft because as I said, this report has not yet been submitted. And you can see what are their groundwater concerns and quality comes out at the top, the, the most often mentioned then quantity. And you can see the others, um, budget and um, staffing issues are up there, drought and climate. So you can see where the um, concerns are, of course, aquifer, uh, overdraft. And the, this ranking of quality at the very top is, is the same as um, what came out on top in that first initial survey we did um, that I discussed earlier. What strategies are um, used to ensure compliance? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we see a lot of um, similarity fines. Uh, we were interested whether self-reporting or required reporting is used, uh, spot checking, some use of criminal penalties, fees for discharge of uh, contaminants and the like. 
Um, we did ask some questions about coordination between quantity and quality agencies, having learned from the prior survey that they're often separated, so we included some questions uh, in this one, and you can see about personal relationships and networks and briefings and so forth, and a couple of states showed little coordination occurring. It looks like four states responded very little coordination. Um, we looked at funding sources, and here you could see federal funding is uh, very important to water quality, and uh, we see state general fund being um, the next most often listed permits and fees, and then others. So um, as, as states and the federal government adjust their funding, um, obviously this is of, of concern to state agencies and maybe leads to more reliance on permits and fees. Um, we asked some questions about budget and where, you know, their current budget has gone over the last 10 years. And you see very few people are in this upper category that I'm circling here with my cursor of more funding. Um, some have the same, but then a number are either somewhat less, less, or much less in funding. So we have a lot of concerns, uh, have to deal with that with, in many cases, less funding. And then we ask, what are the likely issues requiring attention in the next 10 years? And you can see um, water quality, groundwater pumping, water level monitoring, water rights, see mention of climate, mention of oil and gas exploration and production, and then other, other things such as stakeholder disagreements, interstate conflicts, and management of industrial waste. And what we asked what the likelihood of changes in groundwater quality regulations in the next five years, again, crystal balling it, do you think it's likely, unlikely? And you could see that, um, you know, there's almost an equal split, a little bit more on the likely to be considered, but many states not likely to consider changes. And then if we asked what might those changes be, they'll relate, of course, to the earlier responses. I want to point out none is listed here, so we had an N of 47 answering this question, but new water quality standards for unregulated contaminants was the most frequently mentioned, and then you can see assuring sustainable use of groundwater, recharge regulations, uh, groundwater quality standards, oil and gas exploration and production. Um, here, just a few states mentioning groundwater dependent ecosystems. So I thought I had another slide, but I guess I took that out. So in, in conclusion, I'd like to um, provide these summary comments, and that is, the general intent of the overall groundwater governance project was to, is to obtain information on approaches to groundwater governance and management, so to identify and share best practices. I'd say we're still at the early stages of this. Um, due to decentralized authorities, we have to look at states and then within the states, this mosaic idea of approaches. And I've put up here a map of Arizona that shows in color um, the active management areas that I mentioned earlier. I often will show this map to make the point that within states there can be a tremendous variation in how groundwater is, is governed and managed, and that's certainly true in the state in which I live. Um, it can be difficult to get a full complement of state-level responses from one respondent due to separation of authorities for quality and quantity. We know that these are simple surveys we've done. We know that at best they can provide us some good information, but it would be much, much better if we could take a more comprehensive approach to surveying multiple points of contact within government, whether it be the state level, sub-state level, and also stakeholders to get their assessment. And uh, I do plan to, uh, on speaking about this topic further at the AWRA annual conference in Portland, November 5 to 9. Um, so if any of you are going, I hope maybe I can meet you there and we can talk more about this. 
um, I, I put the word challenge in my title because it is a challenge to get a comprehensive understanding. And speaking about conferences, I do want to put in a plug for the AWRA International Specialty Conference that's being held in September 10, 11 um, in Tel Aviv, Israel. I am co-chairing that conference with um, our collaborator, Dror Avisar from Tel Aviv University. And we've called it, uh, entitled it, Cutting Edge Solutions to Wicked Water Problems. We're, we know we have lots of problems. We're looking to focus on some of the solutions to them at this conference. More information can be found on both of these, uh, for both of these conferences on the awra.org website. And with that, I will say thank you. This is a photo of a carved water buffalo, and I guess I kind of am one here. We have pins that some people give out, say darn proud water buffalo, and someone gave me one of these um, several years ago, so my water buffalo is wearing it with pride. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Sharon, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation, um, one of the best we've had. And um, we got some questions. Um, first of all, I want to state that you will have access to Sharon's slides, um, as well as a, uh, an audio recording of the conference, actually audio-visual recording of the conference. And um, you'll be getting, um, if you registered, as a participant and, and are not just watching in on someone else's screen, you will get a link in email, I believe I'm right, Christine, um, directing you to the um, place where you can find that. And actually, if you go to the AWRA website on the right-hand side of the home page, you'll see our webinar center and you click on that and scroll down, you'll have access to the archives, again, assuming that you're either an AWRA member or you registered for this. So. Um, let's get on with some questions. Uh, Cindy Davala, who's uh, very good, she always asks uh, um, a question. Are any states saying that their groundwater information is not accessible? Um, and hi, Cindy, nice uh, that you're listening. Um, I don't <laughs> think anybody said it wasn't accessible. I think, you know, when we when we summarize it, I'd have to go look back at the actual questions. But I think we said extremely, it's highly available or somewhat available. I don't think anybody said it was not available, but okay. I'd have to check. Okay. Um, and here's one from, from a guy I know fairly well, Ken Reed. Sharon, in your view, what are the three greatest challenges facing groundwater management and government in the U.S. in the next three years? Oh, three greatest challenges. That's a tough question. <laughs> I should expect that from Ken. What would I? What? What else would I expect? So, um, I'm not sure if it's a three-year time horizon or a longer time horizon. I think one of the wicked problems of groundwater management is this whole question of how do we manage what we know are fossil aquifers, uh, because. Fossil aquifers we know are not being recharged at the rate at which they're, I mean, are not, are not being recharged at the, way, at the rate at which they're being utilized, yet in many cases they're very, very large. And how do you balance the, the desire and need to utilize a resource against the fact that you're depleting it? So I think that's, that's a big issue and it's a long run issue. I think that a, a shorter run issue would be for areas that wish to exercise some greater management of groundwater, um, what, what can they do to implement groundwater management programs in a reasonable amount of time? And let's look to California, where the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is, you know, a, a major effort to uh, engage in groundwater management, but it's going to be take some years to to get to the point where the plans are developed and established and so forth. So I think how do you track things is a big issue to know you're making progress and you don't wait five years and find out where where we were. And then I think a, a, a significant issue is really educating and engaging the public. 
um, so that they recognize where their water comes from. It's not just the tap when you turn it on, but know where your source water comes from and know more about your water sources. So that's, that's three. I could probably think of three different ones a different day. Okay, great. Uh, the next one from Courtney Van Stoke, who's uh, from the city on the bluff of the Mississippi, Memphis. You mentioned that surface water and groundwater in an area often have different boundaries. How do you think that fact would influence whether a state acknowledges interactions between surface water and groundwater and or regulates them under the same agency? Well, I think the, the harder part of your question is probably that last part about regulating them under the same agency. But um, I think the question of the connection between surface water and groundwater is in a sense a local question, meaning there's groundwater in certain areas, there's surface water in certain areas, and what is the hydrology of the two, and what is the connectivity of the two, and wherever there is connectivity, um, one would argue if you looked at the you know water cycle, hydrologic cycle, that they should be uh, looked at in concert. Um, the issue of the agencies, uh, I guess that really depends upon the scale of those basins and what state level agencies are doing um, versus local agencies. For example, and again, I, I didn't mention this explicitly, but you're giving me the opportunity to say this, in that one of the reasons we undertook this effort is that state level people tend to focus on their states and we tend to get to be experts in our situation and we don't have the time to spend on learning elsewhere. So I'm going to answer this in part for Arizona. Um, on that water map poster, if anybody likes it, we do sell those and you can order them online. Um, we have planning areas shown, we have groundwater basins shown, and the state of Arizona, the Department of Water Resources, our water quantity agency, is undertaking an extensive look at some of the issues of particular sub-areas of the state, identifying if they're groundwater issues, what is the approach best for that area. So I guess I, guess I don't have uh, a really great answer other than saying that you have to look at the local circumstances. I think the regional and local players have to work with the state agency people and see is there something we need to do that's different from the existing overlay of regulations and governance and what ought that be. And that's what's happening in some areas of the state of Arizona and it's not an easy task. Okay, very good. Here's a good question. You can, you can hit a home run with this, like all the others. How important is managed aquifer recharge from Dave Tuthill? Oh, how important is managed aquifer recharge? That is a softball question for me. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that is um, managed aquifer recharge is a, a, a tool, an opportunity to actually connect surface water and groundwater management, even where the laws may not recognize the connection. Uh, we practice it uh, extensively here in Arizona where the law does not recognize a surface water groundwater connection, but we use the availability of surface waters at certain times to recharge aquifers and it's a great tool. It's one that I've worked on a lot from the institutional funding and policy side of things and I see the interest in it uh, regionally and internationally only growing over time. So it's it's uh, something that uh, should be looked at in those uh, uh, call in the call to action items that I mentioned that came out of mm -hmm. Mexico City. Mm -hmm. um, the need to pay greater attention to managed aquifer recharge is one of those that uh, items highlighted. Okay, great. And that's a beautiful segue for yet another plug. Uh, our September issue of Water Resources Impact from AWRA will feature Managed Aquifer Recharge, um, co-edited by yours truly. So hang in there, we'll get it out. Okay, excellent overview, Sharon, with an exclamation point from John Wells. You list 18% of states as addressing land use in their groundwater quantity governance. How many of these build in land use zoning that 
prevents the location up front of heavy water using industries in water short areas? Well, that's a great question. I don't think we got into that level of detail in knowing the answer to that. So I would say um, I, our survey was one of those, I mentioned it was 67 questions. It was the kind of thing that you didn't want people to have to spend more than 15 or 20 minutes. So we didn't get into that kind of detail. So I can't answer that, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, we'll give you a pass. Um, here's actually a, an offer from Dr. Carol Lippincott of the University of Florida Water Institute. She says, um, if you do another survey, let me know and I'll coordinate with the Florida water people to get Florida participation. So there you go. Okay. Well, yeah, and we tried, Carol. So, Carol, if you can email me, it may not be too late, although we're getting ready to get our report in. But uh, we'd love to follow up with you. Thank you. Okay, great. How many states are managing groundwater at a regional scale? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not sure I, c I can give a number to that. And, and I'm not sure in terms of regional scale yeah. um, what, what the question is actually envisioning. Right. Um, so I, I can't give a good answer to that. You know, clearly there are states like Arizona, of course, and California, where there's um, focus on groundwater basins, which will tend to be where the groundwater management is focused. But mm -hmm. the question is, do you have differentials across those groundwater basins, or is it a one-size-fits-all, or do you have it almost um, or largely delegated to the sub-areas like in Texas where there's um, – extensive authority at that sub-state level. So I would say this is another example of just where there's a mosaic and we have to delve a little deeper to, to see uh, at what level. I will say in Arizona and my understanding of um, California's Sigma is that there is a real effort to identify areas based on hydrologic groundwater basin boundaries. But then you can all often ask, well, where do you um, – draw the lines between basins that might be uh, have subflow connectivity and so forth. So that's about all I really could say at this point on that. Okay. I was wondering if Kansas might fall in that area um, as, as one, but that's, Yes, they would. They would. Um, yeah. In fact, I'd have to go back. I participated in a workshop of the American Geophysical Society last October that focused on the Ogallala and it really is very interesting to look at how the different states in the Ogallala area, Nebraska, Kansas, and Texas, and the others, um, they all do things a bit differently. And, you know, in some cases you have in Nebraska, I think it is, you know, the, the state level working on um, surface water and then the sub-state districts working on groundwater, if I've got that right. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of variety. Okay. Very good. How would you explain that climate change is so far down the list of groundwater management concerns? Do you feel this reflects a tendency to focus on short-term over long-term concerns or just the expected absence of direct effects on demand and supply? Um, you know, I think uh, that's, a, that's a good question and I have to go back and see um, as we're compiling our results, there are some areas or questions where we ask people to rank their concerns, so not only to say if there's a concern or not, and I didn't have time to go into that in this presentation. I'll have to go back and look to see, um, you know, where that came in ranking. I think because of, of groundwater, I think that there's certainly a concern, uh, a connection between climate and precipitation and surface water flows and therefore groundwater recharge where there is recharge. And so I think people understand that there are these connections, but the, the importance of this in terms of other concerns related to groundwater might lead to people putting it further down. People still, I think, are, are grappling with understanding what the implications of changing climate are for the, their water systems overall. And I think the issue of quality just tends to be, you know, 
what people will check off first. So whether it's not a concern at all or whether it's just was down there um, and how people responded is a little bit different, difficult. I also think that um, if people are relying on large scale fossil aquifers, they may not see that much of a connection between climate change and the condition of those aquifers. Um, I do think though that in climates such as I live in where uh, warmer temperatures lead to more use of air conditioning and more energy to pump that in or to fuel that uh, 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 power and all that, uh, I do think we recognize there is a connection between use and demands on groundwater and so forth. But I, I just think it depends upon what people were thinking about when they answered the question. Okay. Um, another good one. We haven't heard the S word in description of groundwater governance. How many states build into their framework a goal of sustainable water management? Um, so the, well, we did hear the S word when I mentioned the California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. They've put that word in there. Um, Arizona has management goals that are established by statute for those active management areas, but interestingly enough, the word sustainable is not in that, uh, those goals. And I think there's a question of what does sustainability mean? Um, it's a word used a lot. We know it has certain connotations to it. So I think I'll go back to the answer I gave earlier to um, the question from Ken, Ken Reed about the greatest challenges. Um, for some areas, it may not be sustainable use of groundwater. It may be some kind of managed acceptable depletion rate as opposed to sustainable use of groundwater. I, I think those are discussions that the states and jurisdictions have to, um, have to engage in um, and define what they mean by sustainable use. Okay. Oh, by the way, the, the individual who asked the question about regional management, um, regional is defined as beyond county municipal boundaries. So I think I don't okay. need to but that's just um, FYI. Um, well, no, can I, can okay. I just say something well, sure. about that, Michael, for just one yes. second? Because, Go ahead. because regional could also be within county, um, you know, in certain areas. So yeah. my understanding, um, and we had a, as a visitor here to, um, to the University of Arizona, he gave a lecture and was a guest speaker for my graduate class in water policy. Um, Grant Davis from Sonoma County Water Agency. And if I recall correctly, within the Sonoma County Water Agency area, they had three basins that he identified as having to focus on pursuant to the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So it could be sub-county as well as beyond county lines. So yeah. I, I, I don't think it has to, I, I think it could be any level that we're talking about. Okay, that sounds that sounds reasonable. Um, one of the one of the, and by the way, we're we're after two p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Can you, Sharon? Can you go for about ten more minutes? Sure. Okay, because the, the questions um, uh, keep pouring in. This question I hesitate to ask. It's a very important question, but it would probably take three more webinars to answer it. Um, the individual would like to know how do you suggest delineating a groundwater basin, or maybe if you could point us in the direction of, of maybe a, a good article on delineating a groundwater basin? Well, that's a really good question, but a yeah. bad one for me because I'm not a hydrologist. Um, but I, I, I would be surprised if there were not literature on that. Michael, are you aware of literature on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of literature, but it, but it is not, a, not as straightforward as people think. And in fact, the, the paper by, who's the young woman at Texas A&M, Rosario? Um, yeah, Sanchez. Sanchez yeah. Um, alluded to that in, in, in their paper about the difficulty of discerning, you know, when does an aquifer begin and when does it end, particularly when it's straddling an a international border. I'd refer the listener, um, if, you, if you go to my blog and search on Rosario Sanchez, Sanchez, it should come up. That's 
the best I can do. Well, and I would think that this would be a good question for USGS or somebody there, or even some of the hydrologists, um, you know, at in the state agencies. And and I I would be happy to take this question forward. And Michael, maybe you can make sure I do um, to some of the hydrologists at the Arizona Department of Water Resources, because as I mentioned. The, the boundaries for these active management areas were defined uh, in statute back in 1980. Four active management areas were established, and then in 1994, one of them was split into two. So obviously, there isn't a, a magic way of doing this. And then within each of the active management areas, there may be sub-basins, and, and so for example, in the Phoenix area, there's an East Valley groundwater model and a West Vet Salt River Valley groundwater model. So somehow they were able to determine overall, these are the broad boundaries, but then within each of the active management areas, there may be modeling for subsections within it. So I'd be happy to take this question to... Um, okay. The, the hydrologists at our Department of Water Resources and get back to you. Okay, yeah, and I didn't mean to apply. It's not a good question. It just I figured it would take quite a while to answer it. Um, Nicole Carter wants to know, how has the increase in domestic oil and gas production and its wastewater generation altered, or not, groundwater management? Well, that's another good question. Um, I, I have to say um, that I did have a map that I guess I took out. I, that was the one I was looking for. I was going through the slides about the, um, the issue of gas exploration and, and where it's a concern and where things are going on because we did ask some questions about that. So I'm going to have to go back to our study on that. I do want to say just from my own personal experience because Arizona is not a state that's rich in those kinds of things, uh, natural gas and oil and so forth. That's not one of the issues that we're grappling with here. But it is clearly an issue, as, as I think all the listeners know, that um, has connections to both water quality and water quantity and you know uses of aquifers for deep injection and the like. And I will just state as a personal um, uh, opinion here, not based on any study results, is that, you know, aquifers are spaces that can be used for different things, meaning injection into them as well as extraction from them. And I just think we have to take a careful look at the implications of whatever we're doing and, you know, concern ourselves as to um, aquifer health considerations, including groundwater mining where you end up having compaction and subsidence and the like. So. Okay. I can't give more specific, but um, we can go look back at our, um, our, our survey information on that. Okay. Um, Steve Burgess would like to thank you for your excellent presentation. And um, this is interesting. Managed aquifer recharge is the new name for cyclic storage introduced by Harvey Banks circa 1954. And if you want to see more on that, um, uh, Steve suggests that the viewers check out the 2017 Quasi Cyber Seminar Series on Hill Slope Hydrology in Earth Systems uh, Models. So that's that's something we should all know. It's been what goes around comes around. Okay. Yeah, and you know, just to to mention one quick thing about that is that in Arizona, we tend not to use the terminology managed aquifer recharge. We have a a very excellent um, statutory framework. Uh, uh, we call it storage and uh, recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't, you know, again, uh, what people call it is maybe less important as to what are the objectives and what are the practices and the frameworks used for um, regulating the activity of adding water to an aquifer and then extracting from the aquifer. Okay. Um, I think this next one is for is from um, old friend Jim Ruff down there in Scottsdale or Fountain Valley. Why, why are water quality markets the least used tool for groundwater use and management? Referring to slide number 27. Well, you know, that, that's a good question because when I was looking at these results, that caught my attention because I just don't think water quality markets have been really developed yet. 
And I think in general, water markets talk about a big, big area for discussion and research and so forth is that in many areas, I think water quality, I mean, water markets in general, whether it be quantity or quality are just emerging. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just think, you know, it, it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. I don't think there's much, um, much experience with it and with lack of experience that means usually that there's lack of sharing information so people see the opportunities i i just don't think it's uh well understood at this point okay let's see do do state governance frameworks distinguish between management of fossil versus well recharged aquifer systems well you know that's that's, I think, a question of getting in deeper into the um, the individual regulations, which, again, uh, I just have to state with some apology, there's, there's, uh, we were not able to do. But certainly, I would say, um, in in the case of of Arizona, just talking about recharge and recovery. In order to get a permit to recover stored water through that framework I mentioned for storage and recovery, one of the criteria um, is looking at the rate of decline in water levels, groundwater levels, and if the rate of decline over a certain period of time is greater than um, four feet a year in certain areas, you cannot get that well permitted to be a recovery well in that period of time. So there is a recognition that if groundwater levels are declining, then maybe you shouldn't be extracting water, you know, as, as readily as in an area where they might be stable or increasing. And so I think you have to get a bit into the details to look at, you know, what what are the regulations and I don't want to get into details of Arizona because that's counter to this whole idea of looking at trying to get an overview and looking at best practices but I, I have to say we we have not been able to get into that level of detail okay um, do the political leanings of the states ie red versus blue progressive versus conservative have any influence on the various approaches or attention to groundwater governance well, that's a good question. I have to say we haven't done that mapping. We could easily do that, looking at um, some of these answers in in response to um, or connected to the responses we got. It's interesting, as I was uh, kind of looking at what slides to include or not include, as I mentioned, the, these results on the second survey are really just being compiled right now. And so the slides I was looking at are, are brand new slides, and one of them had the word politics. You know, what are the kind of issues that are policy or politics related over the next five years? And I said, oh, I don't want to talk about politics and talk about groundwater, although we're talking about governance and policy. And of course, politics is one of those uh, items I listed on my list of what affects policy. You can't move away from that but maybe for the for our sake of our information we'll do some overlay of red versus blue but we haven't done it yet well I just think that would be tremendous and really huge so um, I should, <laughs> you should go for it Sharon okay um, I hear you Michael <laughs> okay um, what is what is the role of data in sustainable water management do you have any insight on data management strategies among different states and status of availability for truly assessing groundwater sustainability that's from young shen sun so so that's also a good question i have to say that all of these questions are great and give right. us you know when we listen back to this we're going to take notes and and i'm making some notes as we're going along because these are the kinds of questions that we'd love to ask in and look into in additional work and you know i didn't want to i didn't want to leave us on a any kind of downer at the end of the seminar but but I did mention funding in there. It's, it's a challenge to get funding for this kind of national look. And if people out there listening have some ideas and some ideas for partnering, we'd be very open to that because there's just so much that we could get into in this survey. And, and many of these questions are getting into just the kinds of things that you'd want to look at in a more in-depth analysis. Okay. I think we're running out of 
questions would you do, 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 do how many states regional scale been there done that um, oh we had a question um, I can't remember who it was from I won't mention their name anyway um, do, do you have any sense of how um, the Trump administration may fund this kind of research um, you know just kind of from all your well, I, I, you know, I can only give the answer that I think is the obvious one is that there's tremendous uncertainty now in terms of, you know, funding for um, research, uh, applied research. And I think we really have to wait and see. Um, in one sense, we have to wait and see. On the other sense, I think we all have to engage in conversations where we show the value of what we do to addressing the let's say the wicked water problems the water problems the water issues I mean we know that people talk about water as the next gold uh, or the current goal uh, you know the next oil and like gold and all that and if you look at the statistics about the increased reliance on groundwater mm -hmm. you know again regionally nationally internationally globally whatever way you want to look on it the increase need for water for food production as the po population grows. We all know that we need to be managing our water well. Um, one of the issues with groundwater is if it does get contaminated, it can take, be very difficult to clean up. So hopefully when people think of infrastructure and what we need to have vibrant economies, they're going to recognize the importance of water. And so I hope that we won't see cutbacks and that we'll see uh, potentially increases and that even within whatever pot of money is out there that work along the lines that we've been discussing through these questions will be supported and again happy to enter into partnerships on projects okay one last question okay are there any, I don't think I've asked this yet, are there any strong examples of governance structures or alliances that are effectively bridging the challenges of decentralization, especially regarding the divide between quality and quantity? I don't think I asked No, that. you didn't, you didn't ask that okay. and um, I, you know, Michael, I'm going to make a suggestion here and that is maybe AWRA, NGWA together, we need to have some more workshops and maybe get some of the people who are from the states who could answer these questions in the room. I, I think that there are examples out there, but I don't want to speak with um, authority about another area, but, but I, I think that there are um, agencies throughout the country who do bring together quantity and quality issues and again um, I'll talk about Arizona and I'll talk about managed aquifer recharge and if you're talking about certain types of recharge using mm -hmm. Colorado River water here yeah. um, the permits tend to get issued by the Department of Water Resources but the Department of Environmental Quality takes a look and makes sure there isn't any kind of major problem on recharge of effluent um, you have to get an aquifer protection permit from the Department of Environmental Quality even though the actual facility storage and recovery permits are issued by the Department of Water Resources. And I have to believe that kind of coordination and holistic look is occurring elsewhere as well, but I can't point to this state's doing this or that uh, because certain states don't particularly see themselves as having a water quantity problem when it comes to groundwater it's more surface water surface so water. again I, I I'd love to see us get into more discussion of this okay Sharon this is great I mean 20, 20 minutes over I think must be a record and there's still um, there's still over 55 people on the webinar so that's really incredible and I also want to thank our participants for some really amazing questions and as I said it's provided fodder for several webinars a couple of workshops and maybe a specialty conference so thank you very much um, I've sent around some information about uh, googling some things to find more information uh, Sharon's presentation and the recording will be up in about a week or so and for those of you who uh, have registered for this 
uh, you'll get the link to that and you'll be able to access things and her presentation and anyway Sharon again I want to thank you very much you've um, knocked it out of the park you've actually hit a couple of home runs and I thank you very much and I'll be seeing you soon so take care. My pleasure thank you. Okay Bye. you bet. Bye.